Hello, and welcome to Us versus HPV, the webinar series taking place from January 22nd through January 28th. I am Reed Mergler, the moderator for today's talks. This webinar is hosted by the American Medical Women's Association, the Global Initiative Against HPV and Cervical Cancer, and Indiana University to recognize January as Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. In addition, this webinar is also being hosted to spread awareness about the various diseases caused by the human papilloma virus or HPV beyond cervical cancer and the excellent and effective tools that we currently have to prevent them. Our goal is to raise knowledge through this webinar series and encourage and empower you, the audience, to join us in this campaign. You have a number of ways to access this event. Live stream, dial in, and video replay. All webinars are recorded and are free. You can find more information about this series at us versus HPV at GAIAC.org, that is the GAIAC homepage, or by Googling us vs HPV. You can also find us at Facebook, Instagram, and our Twitter handle is hashtag us versus HPV. Next. A big thank you to our supporters. Today's topic heading is HPV and cervical cancer champions. We have five speakers today and we will then open the floor for questions and answers. You can submit your questions at any time, starting right now through the Q&A icon that you will find at the bottom of your screen. Selected questions from today's topic will be answered live during this session. All handouts are available through the chat box icon also seen at the bottom of the screen. A link to them will also be emailed to you after the webinar. I am the first speaker for today, and the topic is Youth vs. Against HPV, Engagement and Empowerment. As I said, my name is Reed Mergler, and I am a fourth year medical student at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I am aspiring to become an OBGYN, and I am lucky to serve as the team captain for the GAIAC Young Leaders Program. I am also the National Student Secretary for the American Medical Women's Association, and I have been lucky to call Dr. Krishnan my mentor since meeting her at an AMWA conference in 2016. So you may ask, who are the Young Leaders? We are a student and researcher run program with supervision by physician members. It serves as a global platform for youth advocates to network and exchange knowledge regarding HPV and cervical cancer. Additionally, we strive for culturally sensitive materials relevant to the populations that we serve. Our goal is to both empower and educate the next generation to play a proactive role 
in the reduction of HPV-related diseases through vaccination and screening with a focus in eliminating cervical cancer worldwide. To do so, our leaders are divided into three committees. The Outreach Committee launched a campaign with AMWA in 2016 for middle and high school students. And Cassie and I will share what the presentation entails in a few minutes. The Artistic Committee leads creative projects everywhere, every year to spread awareness as well. And the Scientific Committee ensures that our reference sheet is up to date and that knowledge is widespread for all of our student members. The presentation that we offer through AMWA and GAIAC is called Embracing the Power of Youth. And it goes through a series of slides about cervical cancer and HPV. As shown here, it uses creative diagrams of female, female anatomy to demonstrate where cancer can present. It also sheds light on how many people are affected by HPV. It emphasizes that eight out of 10 people will get HPV at some point in their lives. And as we know, it can be spread skin to skin, but is mostly acquired through such sexual contact. Additionally, 75% of HPV infections occur between 15 to 25 years of age, and it is important to highlight that HPV it is, is not gender specific and it can affect anyone. The presentation also recognizes on um, how it can affect the youth and their families use, using gender neutral language. Even without having symptoms, anyone can transmit this virus to their partners. As Dr. Krishnan stated previously in her webinar, it is essential to recognize that a very serious consequence is cervical cancer, taking the life of one young woman every two minutes in this world. It also supports this, the statistic that most HPV clears up on its own, and about, but about 10% persists and may cause disease. The HPV vaccine prevents most cervical cancers and possibly prevents many other HPV-related cancers in both males and females. According to the FDA, the vaccine can be given from ages nine to 45 years old but it is very important for students and families to know that it works best when given to children between ages 11 to 12, when the immune system is strongest and when exposure to the virus is least. So this presentation really encourages children to talk to parents and their doctors about the HPV vaccine and to invest in their future health. To end the talk, we emphasize reminding family members to get the PAP test, spreading the words about the vaccine, and even starting a club at school to help spread this important message. Thank you so much for listening. Our next speaker is Cassie Jones, a medical aesthetician and the GAIAC Outreach Committee leader, who will explain the game she created as part of the outreach campaign.
Hello, thank you very much for having me. My name is Cassie Jones. I am a medical esthetician in New York. I work with young adults struggling to manage skin health with fluctuating hormonal health. Uh, to my role as outreach committee leader, I bring a background in education, having served as an AmeriCorps middle school teacher. My interest in supporting sexual and reproductive health education is owed greatly to the time that I spent as an educator, uh, my work as a maternity doula, and most importantly, my role as an advocate and member of the LGBTQ community. My time working with GAIAC has been dedicated to building the education component to further the organization's outreach and efficiency. Uh, part of my role has been dedicated to writing a curriculum that includes non-binary language, which connects all youth to the importance of building HPV and cervical cancer awareness, as this virus is partial to no gender identity. In order to share this message, I developed an interactive game that leaves a lasting impression, one which can easily be shared with peers and family members. This game is meant to familiarize students with how vaccines um, specifically how vaccines are influencing um, students or influencing, um, sorry, give me one second, um, how vaccines generally function. And since the workshop focuses on cervical cancer prevention and HPV awareness, the game aims to explain how specific cancer causing HPV types are introduced by a vaccine to the human immune system in order to later prevent infection. This game, um, this game can work with any class size. If there are more students than cards, students can work in groups or pairs. The premise of the game is to show how vaccines prepare our body for exposure through the creation of antibodies. The game was designed around an analogy comparing vaccines to mugshots and viruses to offenders. Like an officer bringing an offender in for a mugshot, a vaccine gives the body a picture of potentially harmful viruses that the body must remember. The human body is very smart and only gets smarter as we grow. The body encounters so many invaders every day, some harmful and some harmless, some familiar and some unfamiliar. So to protect itself, the body builds an immune system by remembering the unfamiliar invaders. Now you might ask, how can the body keep track of so many invaders? As our body is introduced to so many vi different viruses through vaccines, after conquering what would be best described as a small battle, our immune system prepares itself for any future encounters by remembering the look of that specific virus. New antibodies are created and given only one job, and that is to look out for the mugshot should it reappear. Through this game, you will learn how specific the body is when cataloging, identifying, and attacking harmful viruses. The HPV vaccine prevents most cervical cancers and also shows potential to prevent other HPV-related cancers in both men and women. The vaccine available in the United States targets nine HPV types, four being the most high risk. So the directions of the game, um, which is to be prepared by the instructor. So through this game, uh, students will understand how specific the body is when cataloging, identifying, and attacking harmful viruses. There are five categories. Each will be represented by an illustrated note card, which you can see illustrated on the right. The first HPV vaccine antibodies labeled as mugshot. The second HPV virus infected cells, which we include four different strains of HPV that will be focused on in the game. Three flu vaccine antibodies, which are labeled four the flu vi virus infected cells and five healthy red blood cells. Since there are four HPV types being targeted by the vaccine, this game requires a minimum of six student groups. More groups can be added if you choose to add other viruses and healthy cells. So the first step is to create note cards that clearly mark group type. So uh, the, the designed note cards indicate virus and vaccine, vaccine being mugshot, so that they look identical. In the first and second category, the most harmful HPV virus types are targeted by the current vaccine, types 6, 11, 16, and 8. Categories 3 and 4, you choose a flu virus with a complementary mugshot card. You may also choose another virus or add viruses if the group is larger and you want to give the game variety. 
Category five, you create healthy red blood cells and the number is up to you and also the type. And you may choose to create healthy skin cells or healthy lymphatic cells, for example. These cells will stand alone at the end of the game to show students that the vaccine process is a highly specific, specified one. The immune system prepares the body with cells um, with only one job, and that is to identify the mugshot, attacking only the image that matches and nothing else. The students are split into groups, uh, handed out the marked cards with illustrations face down, making sure that the students have their group before they receive the note, note cards. When groups are created and cards are distributed, students flip over their card and then have the mugshot card holders only circle the room to find their match. Make sure that when students find their match, they stand next to that student and signal that they found their match. They can give you a thumbs up or a hands up. When everyone is matched, except for the healthy cells, who should be standing near each other in their own group, have everyone go around and read off the card and have students clarify which role they are playing, either antibody, infected cell, or healthy cell. To close the game, ask students two questions. First, why are the healthy red blood cells standing alone? The answer should look like the red blood cells are healthy cells and do not carry any viruses and should not be attacked by the immune system. Immune cells that have been created post-vaccination, also known as antibodies, only look, out for the, only look out for and attack the cells which carry the mugshot given by the vaccination. The second question, why are none of the HPV mugshots paired up with the cell infected with the flu virus? The answer should look like, our immune system is a highly specified one, and only the antibodies that recognize the virus as unfamiliar or recognize the virus from previous infection will attack. In other words, if that infection does not match the mugshot carried by our HPV antibodies, they will not attack the flu infection. There are more specific directions on how to play this game in video form, which will be accessible via um, the GAIAC YouTube. Um, and if you would like the game also received uh, via email, that is possible, and you can let us know toward the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to continuing the fight to end HPV and cervical cancer. Thank you so much, Cassie, for that lovely demonstration of the game. Our next speaker is Olivia Roy, a fourth year medical student at the Northeast Ohio Medical University and the GAIAC Artistic um, Committee leader, who will explain the different creative projects. Thanks, Reed. Hi, my name is Olivia Roy. I'm a fourth year medical student at the Northeast Ohio Medical University, and I'm also aspiring to be a future OBGYN physician. I'm currently the leader of the GAIAC Arts Committee, and I was the former chair of the National Studio Amor Arts Committee. Oh. Excuse me, sorry. So, um, the goal of the Art Committee at GAIAC is to allow survivors and those affected by HPV and cervical cancer to share their stories in an effort to spread awareness about the treatment and prevention of cervical cancer. In the past, we have had the opportunity to work on projects such as To Take On the Unknown, which was a video project that told the stories of women surviving cervical cancer diagnoses and treatments through the traditional Indian dance form known as Kuchipudi. This was in conjunction with the Asim Kala Initiative, which was formed by the previous leader of this committee, Dr. Shilpa Dermvimula. This past year, we worked on a project called Love, Pap Smears, and HPV Vaccinations. For this, we brought together family, friends, and partners to give their take on what it is like being diagnosed with or having someone close to them be diagnosed with cervical cancer in order to encourage the public to get screened for HPV. Now for this year's project, it's called Thrive, Artwork for Survivors by Survivors. We wanted this project to be something that can be built upon for years to come as we collect and showcase art forms of many kinds to the world that can bring light to the emotional and physical toil that can come with the cancer diagnosis, as well as the love and hope that guide a survivor through it all in order to thrive. 
We are currently accepting submissions to showcase, and you can email us at artgayak at gmail.com and visit us on Instagram at art underscore G-I-A-H-C. That's at art underscore Gayak. Thanks. Thank you, Olivia. So now I'm happy to introduce Lynn Barclay as our next speaker. Lynn is the president and CEO of the American Sexual Health Association. She will be speaking on the National Cervical Cancer Coalition, an advocate for cervical health. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Reed, and thank you to everybody else. Uh, let me see if my slide advancer is working. Come on, not working. Okay, can you guys advance my slides for me? Okay, so the American Sexual Health Association is more than 100 years old. We were founded in 1914, and we were founded to really interpret the science and talk to people around the country about what was going on because, of course, in 1914, we didn't talk about things. Um, certainly not what was originally called venereal disease, sexually transmitted diseases, and now sexually transmitted infections, of which HPV is obviously one of them. Next slide. <clears throat> so we've had three names. We were founded as the American Social Hygiene Association, the term of the day. In 59, we became social health, apparently the term of the day. And then in 2012, we became American Sexual Health Association. So we, do a, we now do a broad range of subjects uh, around sexual health, not just limited to disease. Next slide. But an important program of ours is the National Cervical Cancer Coalition. We had been doing HPV awareness for decades, um, but we were approached about taking on this group, which is really volunteers around the country who advocate and educate people in their community about cervical cancer, as well as other HPV diseases. Next slide. So we have about 49 chapters around the country. So these are volunteers who very often they've had cervical cancer or cervical health issues, or they are relatives of someone who did. We have a husband who did, you know, so we, we've had several different people. There, they, we have, so we had, some chapters have more than one leader, so that's why we have 51 leaders. We're in, 50, we're in 29 states and the District of Columbia and growing every day. And they, their role is to do some kind of event. So, so very often they may be focused on fundraising, jewelry parties, runs, showings, you know, all kinds of things. Or it could be a straight, you know, showing up at a health fair, talking to people about HPV and HPV disease. And then I had the comment that we had our chapter leader conference, but that started a couple of weeks ago. I got my timing all messed up. Next slide. <clears throat> One of the things that ASHA does as part of our promise to educate is we have a lot of print materials. Um, if anybody ever needs a topic, they just kind of come ask us. And all of our print materials are also in Spanish. Next slide. We also have websites though. So clearly this is the NCCC website um, and each website is tailored to a different group, a different topic, et cetera. This one is obviously HPV and cervical cancer. Um, so lots and lots of people visit these sites and gather all kinds of information every day. Next slide. We're also integrally involved in the HPV Roundtable, um, which is run by the American Cancer Society. Um, and so they're, they're, of course, an important partner. I saw that they were one of the partners in this, um, in this slide series, um, webinar series. And so they are really moving the dime or moving the needle on the subject of HPV. Next slide. We also do HPV provider education. We, we you know, originally thought of ourselves as really just focused on, or primarily focused on the public. But what we found is that it's not that simple and that we really need to be talking to all those players. So we actually talk to policy makers. We talk very frequently to the press to get, you know, the story straight for them. And, and then we said, okay, let's do more with provider education. So we've done quite a bit of CE, CME, uh, enduring, et cetera, live and enduring 
kind of trainings and are in negotiation or in discussion to do some more as I speak. Next slide. <clears throat> I, I mentioned media relations. Um, I, I was trying to figure out what were the ones that would make the most sense. So we get calls frequently, probably every day or every other day. If something hits the news, then, you know, we get slammed with a lot of questions. But we also do a lot in the social media sphere, and we're working hard to figure that out. But we have some really great success with Twitter and with Pinterest. Pinterest was a tough one. We're, we're digging in with Instagram. We do a lot with Facebook. But one of the things we also did was we started a program called um, – ASH ambassadors. And so ASH ambassadors are volunteers around, to be honest, around the world who talk to their social media network about all things sexual health. But we, then we said, let's take that to a narrower viewpoint and do only HPV and cervical cancer. So we started a group called NCCC ambassadors. If anybody wants to sign up for, to be an NCC ambassador, it simply means we send you messages that you can use, don't have to use. You can use your own messages, but that you send out positive um, messages uh, to the people who will see what it is that you have to say and likely respect it because we know we respect what our friends tell us over many others. Next slide. So I, I don't think we're taking questions now. That was my mistake, so I apologize. So next slide. So I have the great, great honor to introduce to you Bobby and Allegra Woodard. These are two of our chapter leaders, and I'm not going to steal their thunder by telling you what um, they do, but they are our go-to people very, very often, and I, I wish I had about, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred of them just like them. So take it away, Bobby and Allegra. Greetings, everyone. Thank you. And I volunteer as NCCC chapter leaders. We're passionate about helping others because we understand firsthand what it means to be diagnosed with a disease that kills women in the US each year. The majority of our efforts are focused toward providing support, raising HPV awareness, providing educational resources, and other crucial information to survivors and their families. We also share our story with future healthcare providers when we present at colleges and universities. Learning about my cancer diagnosis crushed me. I underwent surgery and embarked on a slow and lengthy road to recovery. The life-saving surgery eradicated the cancer, but the procedure also launched me into full menopause at the age of 36. The idea that I may not have a chance to see my teenage daughter graduate from high school and losing the essence of what I believe made me a woman was devastating. The, re the relationships with my husband and my daughter were altered immediately. I was no longer the same. Outwardly, all seemed familiar, but the inward devastation turned my world upside down. Nothing prepared our family for the immediate and long-lasting effects of a radical hysterectomy and cancer survivorship. Today, I have a sense of empowerment. I am armed with a determination to assist other women, family members, and caregivers to battle the personal issues related to cervical cancer. Our partnership with the National Cervical Cancer Coalition is the perfect combination of knowledge and passion. NCCC has provided us with a space to network with other survivors and contribute to the future of care at a global level. In December of this year, our family prepares to celebrate 20 years of cancer survivorship. Now, Bobby, can you please share your perspective and experience of our journey? Oh, this is Bobby. Uh, let me reiterate, this is our 20th year of Allegra being cancer free. And I must admit, I'm still learning about how it affected her both mentally and physically. It has been difficult for her to discuss some aspects from her diagnosis, operation, and the adjustment to the changes that occurred in her life after the operation and the diagnosis. During her initial diagnosis, I must confess, it was trial and error on my part, mostly error but I was determined to hang in there and do whatever was necessary to support my life. 
my wife. What I realize now is that I did not have a clue. And frankly, 20 years ago, the military environment was not a wealth of knowledge. What I've learned throughout this process is that the prognosis of cervical cancer is not only an issue for women, the husbands, children, brothers, sisters, and loved ones in the immediate circle all suffer. Not the physical pain, but we all share the emotional and physical logical scars of a diagnosis of cervical cancer. I have learned that more men need to step forward and learn how they can help other men be better supporters for their loved ones. Without bringing this cancer out of the darkness and into the light, it will remain for some an embarrassment and continue to stigmatize women diagnosed with cervical cancer as not being complete women. I must confess my wife is one of the strongest women that I know, but it changed her. And I and my wife, we go out each and every day trying to help others who are diagnosed with cervical cancer live prosperous, remain married if they are married, and have some self-worth about themselves. We will continue to do this, and we welcome this opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allegra and Bobby and Lynn for sharing your story and sharing the facts about the organization. We have a few minutes for questions and answers. And I see that some um, posted in the Q&A and I greatly appreciate that. At this time, we will focus on the, um, the Youth Leaders Program and instead of focusing on the vaccine details themselves. And please refer to the um, webinars last week for, that, for those details. We had a question about criteria and qualification for students to become part of the program. To become part of the program, it is important to, it is open to all medical students, nursing students, pharmacy students, and any other students in healthcare. It is also um, open to college students interested in health or a healthcare related um, career, and they can approach us and, follow, and we will follow up with them for more questions. The presentation is for these qualified students to take it to middle and high schools to present it to those students there. And it has been given in um, different cities such as New York um, and in Portland, Oregon as well. Thank you. Um, for, um, for access to the presentation, there will be a handout um, to, from today listed on the Google Drive. And but to access the actual presentation we want to give to the middle and high school students, you will have to um, be in contact with us and, and um, we will guarantee, we will um, give you access once your identification is verified as well as your um, level of education. So one question was, and this is, uh, geared towards Lynn, um, are NCC chapters present outside the U.S.? And if so, where? We do have some. We have been very cautious um, with the international because there's often money involved because they're doing fundraising events, and we want to make sure that there's um, transparency and and we can you know have a degree of control so if someone wants if you go to the nccc 
www.ontheonline.org, you'll see where you can sign up to be a chapter leader. Um, and it, and you can, you can do events without being a chapter leader though. Uh, so there's, there's lots of ways that you can be involved. Okay. Thank you. Then another one of our participants said, I am from the U S but currently based in Australia as a PhD student doing research in cervical cancer screening in low and middle income countries. How can I be more involved in NCCC from afar? Yeah, like I said, I, th I think if they if they read if anybody wants to reach out through the NCCC website, um, those emails go straight to my staff, and you know they're going to let me know if they've got something you know out of the ordinary, and then we try to figure it out. So I don't foresee a problem. And as I say, you don't have to be a full chapter leader because there's requirements to be a chapter leader. We don't let just to be frank, we don't let just anybody say they're a chapter leader. We have expectations. So, but if you, for whatever reason, we have people who say, I don't want to be a full chapter leader, but hey, let me run this education event. And we're thrilled about that. Okay. And then also, um, can you just clarify what specifically do the NCC chapters do? So it, once you sign, hey, Allegra, do you want to answer that? You may be better than me, although I'm totally happy to do it. Hi, Lynn. Yes. So as the chapter leader, we are required to um, establish a yearly plan. And in that plan, you will specify the type of activities that you will be engaging with the community during the year. It keeps us accountable of our the process that we're doing. And we have to register before and after each event. For example, I partner with the George Mason University uh, Department of Health, and we have a presentation of a documentary, and we do this once a year, and uh, future care provider students attend the presentation, and after that, we answer questions. Normally, we present a panel of experts. Uh, the panel of experts include survivors, includes um, nurses, doctors, uh, also, um, we, we have an opportunity to interact with the students and, and they ask all sorts of questions. We share uh, the printed material with them and we do that once a year. You may want to add some more to that, Lynn. Um, as, as I said earlier, there's all, there's a, the limits to the type of events that you can do are your imagination. Um, and so when someone reaches out and says, hey, what's a good idea? we have plenty of people who can give someone uh, great ideas. I mean, we have one chapter leader who her sole event, besides she's a, she's a healthcare provider, so she does education events that are uh, in that space. But she, we have these little silver bracelets, cancer bracelets, and she walks around and talks to people about the bracelets and cervical cancer, and then they buy them, and, then, and that's her fundraiser. So there's, there's an enormous array of opportunities to be involved that whatever it is that meets you where you are and what you need. Hi, Lynn. Also, if I may, um, our chapter has created a chemo care package that we deliver to Life with Cancer once a year. And that's a way of reaching out to our community as well. Mm -hmm. that's, and we love that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so this is geared towards Olivia. Um, where can we get access to the cervical cancer artwork from survivors? Hi there. Thanks for the question. Um, so we will be posting um, the artwork on the Instagram page, which was actually just started uh, about a month ago. So we're in the process of bolstering that. Um, so any artwork that people are willing to submit to us would be very welcome because we want to try and um, get that out there. But currently we do have the past projects on the website um, for GAIAC, which is www.gaiac.org. Um, and if you go on there, you can find the past projects on there as well. Great, thank you so much. And then um, some asked about getting the vaccine game um, and it would be great um, if you could just shoot us an email um, to get those, um, to get the game. Um, we'd be happy to share it with you. 
Additionally, for simple instructions for the present for the game and the uh, presentation, um, those are also uh, totally available for people who want to share the game with others. Um, and just to clarify about the presentation, um, it is to educate middle and high school students about HPV and HPV related diseases, and it's to give them information and to empower them so that they're like in their own creative ways can be part of eliminating the very first cancer for the face of this earth. We think this is very exciting for the next generation to be involved in. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of our question and answer session. Um, and additionally, that brings us to the final event for our week long webinar series. Please visit us um, on the GAIAC webpage for details on accessing handouts and recordings of the webinar series. We will now wrap up with a very inspirational movie called Lady Ganga. This short film is based on the story of Michelle Baldwin, a mother of three who died at the age of 46 from cervical cancer just because she did not get a pap smear for 10 years. This film is an impactful educational piece reminding us to get vaccinated and screened and was one of the major reasons that I became part of GAIAC three years ago. In fact, Lady Ganga was screened over the weekend at the Raw Science Film Festival in Los Angeles, where groups of the audience from Hollywood were present. It is our hope that celebrities will also join us in the Us versus HPV campaign to eliminate cervical cancer worldwide. Thank you so much to everyone today for participating in our webinar series. And we look forward to you joining us in our HPV awareness campaign. Thank you again. This is the story of two journeys. Separated by time and space. But connected through something even stronger. something that could save the lives of millions of women around the world. In northern India, high in the Himalayas, a preschool teacher named Nilza begins her day at sunrise. She works all day, every day, until well past sundown. Her 12-year-old son, Smala, lives three hours away from his mom in order to attend one of the top schools in the region. For Nilza, the distance is a necessary price to pay for her son to get a proper education. Yeah, it is sad, but education is very important for children. Computer is an electronic data processing machine which accepts data in Smala loves and depends on his mother, who selflessly works every day to support her family putting their needs and priorities above her own. But neglecting her own health 
could be devastating. Not just to Nilza, but to her son as well. Nilza had no idea that even without physical symptoms, her body could be harboring one of the biggest killers of women in the world. And then she saw the story of Lady Ganga. The River Ganga in India is considered to be the country's spiritual lifeline. For Nilza, this was even more literal than she would realize. And it would link her and a woman named Michelle Baldwin forever. Any pain here? Yeah. Michelle Baldwin was a mother from the USA who was dying of cervical cancer. Once I start getting sick, how long does it take? to die. She was given only a few months left to live. Shouldn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. I just gotta get a pap screen. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, she decided to do the impossible. She would break a world record to help bring global attention to the disease that was killing her. Michelle left for India, a country she loved, to stand up paddleboard a thousand kilometers down the Ganga in order to spread awareness about cervical cancer, which is caused by an extremely common virus called HPV. In India, 74,000 women a year die of cervical cancer. This cancer is 100% preventable. I'm here for the women who are voiceless. This is how Michelle Baldwin became known as Lady Ganga. My pain stopped the first day I paddled. With a limited time left to live, the separation from her children was at times unbearable. But they were soon reunited. Along with her dream of educating women, Michelle also wanted to find inner peace. And even though she dreamed that the gonga would cure her, it didn't but it did give her a remarkable gift. It became very, very clear to me that I had been completely healed. That healing, though, is not incompatible with death. When she returned home from India, her health quickly got worse. I believe in miracles, I want a miracle. Why can't we have a miracle here too? She finally made peace with the fact that she was going to die. This is reality, and all I can do is make my dying change that for others. Which wasn't always easy for her loved ones to accept. Doesn't look like we're gonna get a miracle here. I'm angry, you know, I'm, I don't know. Michelle believed that her story could save lives. So she allowed filmmakers to show everything with nothing off limits because she wanted people to see firsthand that cervical cancer kills. It gives me peace to feel compassion for my body that's withering and dying rather than anger or despair. Yeah. It just all hurts. If she saves one person from the pain she's gone through, then it'll all be worth it. Her story also happens to be my story. Open for 
to them. Yum. Because Michelle Baldwin was my mother. My mom loved us very much and always made sure that my siblings and I had our proper health checkups. And she even had us vaccinated for HPV. The virus that causes cervical cancer. Weeks after returning from India, my mother died. We took her body to the mountains of Colorado, and in the spirit of India, had a traditional open pyre funeral. I tried to stay positive. She's been the biggest inspiration to me, and I think she's going to inspire the whole world. But inside, I couldn't help but realize that I would never see my mother again. Her death left a hole in my life, and if she would have known the risks of ignoring her checkups, she would be here today, and I would have my mother. If no kids lost their mom from HPV, the world would be amazing. because it's preventable. Almost three years after her passing, my grandma and I went to India. took my mom back to the river Ganga. As we returned her ashes to the river, something magical happened. At the end of everything is the beginning of something else. Just two weeks later, not far from where the Ganga first starts as a trickle in the Himalayas, my mother's story was about to change the life of a woman she'd never even met. When word spread around Nilta's village that there was a video about my mom's story in their language, many women came to watch, including Nilta. After the video, they were told that a women's health camp was offering free cervical cancer screenings, just three hours away, where Smala, Nilta's son, lives. They were so inspired by my mom's story that the morning after, nearly every woman in the village made the trip to the health camp. Nilza didn't have any symptoms, but she made the journey to get screened anyway. And during her checkup, she got some unexpected news. You have a little bit of um, a change on the cervix. So we're going to do a very simple treatment for you. Yeah, are you okay with that? Okay. She had an advanced precancerous lesion on her cervix, which, if left untreated, could become cancer and might have eventually taken her life, like my mom's. Five years, ten years down the line, I dare not think what would have happened if, if she hadn't been screened. That's why I say it's one life saved. So this is what we took out, you see here? Okay, yeah. Okay. Fortunately, the doctor was able to take care of it with a simple procedure that same day. 
If it's all finished, yeah? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, so you, you won't feel any pain afterwards either. Okay, just take some medication. I don't want anyone else to go through what I went through with my mom. And I think it's really important to give women access to that health care that's so necessary. I was 12 years old when my mom died, the same age as Smala. Nothing can bring back my mom. But knowing that because of her death, a little boy's mother was able to live means that she did not die in vain. Have your kids vaccinated for HPV. Please don't make the same mistake my mother made. Get screened for cervical cancer. Your children need you. Help Lady Ganga become an international movement. Please share my mom's story and help us save lives.